with SummerSlam 2012 coming up tomorrow night, I thought it'd be cool to kind of take a look back and uh, give you all a little bit of an insight to some of my earliest wrestling experiences. Uh, so I thought it'd be cool to talk about my first ever live wrestling pay-per-view. My parents ordered it for me in 1991. It was the SummerSlam of that year, and I still have the VHS. The box is torn to shit. Of course, this thing is as old as dirt, but... Uh, you know, it's a two-sided box here. And I remember seeing both of these posters in uh, the, the covers that you see on the box art. There's Liz and Randy, because they had their wedding on this show, uh, The Match Made in Heaven, and then The Match Made in Hell, which is Undertaker, or Undertaker, Ultimate Warrior and Hulk Hogan on the cover. And it, you know, this, this picture looks nowhere near as cool as I thought it did when I was a kid. Cause I, again, I remember seeing both of these pictures around it for advertisements of the show. And this picture kind of looks like uh, Ultimate Warrior is about to, to use Iron Sheik vernacular uh, to humble Hulk Hogan. But uh, yeah, it's kind of strange. But yeah, SummerSlam 91 was my first wrestling pay-per-view ever. I was six years old, and I loved it. It was, it was great. It was, it's so funny how many pay-per-views happen nowadays. And it's like, you know, the kids just don't have... The kids today, and I'm, I'm really dating myself, and I'm really making myself sound old, but the kids today, I feel, don't have the same experience with wrestling pay-per-views that I did. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that there's just so many of them now. Uh, you get one a month from two companies, as opposed to back when I was a kid, you had four a year from two companies, so eight all together. And it was so much better that way, because it, it really built excitement just waiting for the show regardless of what they were doing on tv it was just god you have to wait this long for the next one wow that's crazy and it's it's amazing to even fathom that now that you have to wait more than four weeks for a pay-per-view uh but yeah that's kind of what we had back then and it was it was a, it, it to me it added a lot to the experience i remember um watching the previews, the commercials, on the pay-per-view channel. And they used to show them with a bunch of movie trailers, because, you know, the movies are on pay-per-view, too. And you'd see a bunch of movie trailers and the SummerSlam commercial all in, like, an endless cycle. And I used to sit there after school and just watch that pay-per-view channel for, I, I think, for, like, the straight week before the show. Just watch that pay-per-view channel for, like, an hour, just watching that endless cycle of commercials for the upcoming shows. Uh, it was just, uh, I, I just couldn't wait. I was so excited. And, um, and I'll never forget this. For some reason, this always stuck with me. The two commercials, the two movie trailers, that really stick out to me when I think back on waiting for SummerSlam 91... Uh, were Star Trek VI, which I, to be perfectly honest, I was never the biggest Star Trek fan. Loved Wrath of Khan. That is one of my favorite movies ever. But for some reason, I never saw any of the other Star Trek movies until recently. Uh, but the Star Trek VI trailer really stuck with me. I thought it looked like kind of a really dark film. And I watched it uh, a couple years ago for the first time, and I was like, wow, that was actually pretty good. The evens and odds rule with Star Trek movies really hold up well. Um, two's very good. Four, I think is. Uh, I thought four was going to be shit. I actually really enjoyed it. Uh, it was very funny. Um, six was very good, and then you got one, which almost killed me. Three, which was just basically just a giant retconning of two, which kind of pissed me off. And five, which <laughs> it was fun. It was something. It was funny. I'll give it that. It was uh, not for the reasons that they intended, though. It was. Uh, it's pretty bad. So. I, I thought, you know, Star, I always heard Star Trek fans talk about the evens and odds rule uh, when judging the movies. And I was like, you know, that held up very well. And Six was a really good one. And it looked like an interesting movie to me as a kid. And for some reason, again, I just never got sucked into Star Trek outside of Wrath of Khan, which I loved. I think it was because Khan dies. And I don't think I'm giving away a spoiler there. I think Khan, it was because Khan died in Star Trek Two, as did Spock. And they were my two favorite characters in the movie. So I was just kind of like, eh. Of course, I didn't realize that Spock came back in <laughs> in a gigantic cop-out. That's what 3 should have been called, The Search for a Cop-Out. Um, but yeah, Star Trek VI, I remember seeing that trailer a lot. And the other one that sticks out to me is The Hand That Rocks the Cradle, which was uh, you know a horror-slash-thriller film about an evil babysitter, an evil nanny that tries to destroy a family. And uh, the trailers really scared me as a kid. It just looked like a really intense, very scary movie. Keep in mind, I was six years old. Uh, so the stuff that was scary to me back then almost seems laughable now. But uh, I thought the commercials were very, very distinctive and very, 
you know, they really stood out. And I saw that movie a couple years ago as well, and I was like, you know what? I remember seeing the trailers as a kid, and I never saw the fucking movie. I'm actually going to sit down and watch the movie. It was a piece of shit. <laughs> it was a total piece of shit. It's like that episode of Doug where he goes to see the monster movie, and he was so scared of seeing the monster that he kept looking down on the floor every time he went to go see the movie. And then when he finally looked up and saw the monster, it was just laughable. So, uh, yeah, that's what this was like, where it was like, wow, I was scared of this movie as a kid, and it's a total piece of shit. It's one of those cliched movies where they add a new person to the family. Orphan did this, where they adopted a new child. Uh, it's, you know, it's always a new kid, or a stepmother, or in this case, a nanny. And they add a new person to the family, and all this bad stuff starts happening, and nobody puts two and two together that the new person is behind it all. It's just Everybody just acts so stupid, and this movie was one of the worst offenders of that um, and one of my go-tos, actually, whenever an obvious revelation is made, where one of the characters finally comes to, you know, finally displays brain power and says, Oh, I think that this is going on here. Or, uh, in this movie, there was a line where the mother finally says, You know, a lot of bad stuff has been happening since the nanny, we brought on the new nanny. Uh, my go-to to reaction for that, I guess my riff, uh, you know, Mystery Science Theater reference, uh, my standard riff is for Troll 2, uh, that line where it takes them 45 minutes to realize that Nilbog is goblin spelled backwards. <laughs> Nilbog is goblin spelled backwards. So I like to say that whenever an obvious revelation comes to pass, usually in a horror movie. But uh, you don't want to hear me talk about movies. You want to hear me talk about uh, SummerSlam 91. So, yeah, I waited a really long time for the show. It happened. And I loved it. It was great. I have a lot of fond memories of that show, and I remember every bit of it. Again, going back to there being so many pay-per-views today, shows happen nowadays, and six months later, I will completely forget about them. And that's just, I think a lot of that has to do with just the sheer volume of pay-per-views that are out there now. It's just so easy to forget them now. But this one, because there were so few pay-per-views a year, uh, this one stands out to me, and I remember every pit of it. Plus, it was also my first one. I, I lost my wrestling pay-per-view virginity that day. Um, the stuff that really sticks out to me on that show, um, seeing Ricky Steamboat in the opening match, that match, he was in a six-man tag. It was him, Texas Tornado, and British Bulldog versus Warlord and Power and Glory. Ricky Steamboat, I had never seen him before, or if I did, it was only in squash matches. And that match, seeing him there, made me go, wow, I want to see more of that guy. So I just immediately went nuts. Anything with Ricky Steamboat, I had to get my hands on. So I became a huge Ricky Steamboat fan after that show. Because uh, I just really like watching him. And to this day, he's still one of my favorite wrestlers. And I maintain this. I have never seen Ricky Steamboat have a bad match. Ever. Um, squash matches don't count. Like the shit that you would see on Superstars, those matches don't count. But I have never seen Ricky Steamboat have what I would call a bad match. And I could go down wrestling's history. Shawn Michaels, Bret Hart, Triple H, The Rock, Stone Cold, The Undertaker... Uh, even CM Punk, everybody. I've seen them all have bad matches. Randy Savage, even. I've seen him have bad matches. I've never seen Ricky Steamboat have a bad match. So if some, anybody's seen a bad Ricky Steamboat match, please send me a video or a tape or something because I would love to see it because I don't think it exists. It's like, uh, it's like a unicorn. <laughs> it doesn't exist. There's no such thing as a bad Ricky Steamboat match. Um, and the second match on the card was Bret Hart versus Mr. Perfect, which I shouldn't even have to talk about that match. I mean, that match is just legendary to a lot of people. It is one of the best pure wrestling matches that I've ever seen, and really a reminder of what the Intercontinental title used to be like. Um, to me as a kid, uh, the world title, the Hogan belt, was the, sh um, the... That was the showman title. That was... That was the belt that the big stars fought over, and uh, the big larger-than-life characters. But to me, the Intercontinental title was the workhorse belt. That was the belt where you got the best matches. And it was typically guys like Brett, Tito, Greg, uh, Ricky Steamboat, Ra Randy Savage, and Mr. Perfect, who I still think is the best Intercontinental champion ever, all fighting for that belt. And it was great. And a uh, fantastic match, one of, uh, one of my personal favorite matches of all time. And it was great to see Brett, who ultimately ended up becoming one of my favorite wrestlers. My personal favorite wrestler from the 90s. Um, not so much now. I cringe whenever he wrestles now, and I hope he never does again. But um, back then, I mean, Bret Hart was my favorite to watch. I just loved watching his matches. And to see him win the Intercontinental title um, was really, really cool. So, I mean, this show made me a huge fan of both Ricky Steamboat and Bret Hart. Absolutely. Um, and I'd seen the Hart Foundation before, but uh, Brett was just starting to break out as a singles guy, and for him to win that belt the way he did in that awesome match was very, very cool. Um, there was an, uh, 
what else happened? Uh, Legion of Doom won the tag titles from the Nasty Boys. You know, solid match. But even just watching that match, and though it's not one of their more spectacular uh, matches, it was cool to see uh, LOD, the Road Warriors, win the tag titles. And just watching them, even back then, I knew that they were something special, and they were legendary. Just by looking at them, I knew that they were awesome. And again, going back and watching their history, all their stuff from the NWA and all the different territories, uh, they were the basically the tag team version of Goldberg. They used to just go out there and murder people, and it was fun. It was very cool to watch. I loved watching LOD uh, just go to town and wreck people. It was great. Um, another match, I talked about this in uh, my Q&A video, one of my favorite uh, early SummerSlam matches that doesn't get talked about a whole lot. WWE, actually, on their website, they just listed the 25 best SummerSlam matches of all time. And while there were a couple matches on there that made me go, huh? This match, I was happy that they put this one on there because I feel it's heavily underrated. Uh, Ted DiBiase versus Virgil for the Million Dollar Title. And uh, it was just, it was Ted DiBiase's best work. I mean, you couldn't ask for a better villain than that. He was just fantastic. Uh, the way, I mean, he carried the whole match because if you've ever seen Virgil work, it was never anything spectacular. Uh, so DiBiase basically just carried the whole thing and he made you want to see Virgil kick his ass. He, he was that good. Uh, and it was just a wonderful moment. Great feel-good moment when Virgil won the title. The only time he ever did anything of substance. The feud was fantastic. I remember the build-up to that thing was excellent. And uh, starting with Royal Rumble 91, heading into WrestleMania, and then you get this big match here at SummerSlam. This is one of the few cases where the SummerSlam match is far better than the WrestleMania match. Uh, and it was great. I loved it. And another thing that really helped it, and I haven't talked about this yet, but... Uh, on commentary, you had the three-man team of Gorilla Monsoon, Bobby Heenan, and Roddy Piper. Now, everybody talks about Monsoon and Heenan and the chemistry that they had, where they were just really, really funny. Heenan was hilarious. But when it was time to really call the matches, they could really make you care about what was going on. You add Piper to the mix, and it was even better. They, I would go as far to say they're the best three-man team I've ever heard on the booth. And as far as I know, they only did this one show together, and that's kind of a crime. And that's a shame, because they were excellent. Uh, Piper actually had a role in the storyline here. He was actually Virgil's trainer, and the one that inspired him to dunk Ted DiBiase and, and go off on his own. And Virgil on commentary, because he was personally invested in this, he acted like a character that was part of the storyline and did so believably. He added so much passion it, just by what he was saying, and he added a lot to this. Even more, I mean, Ted DiBiase was doing all the work in the ring, but then you had Piper on commentary really selling the story and really making this match feel larger than life. It, it was an outstanding, I think an outstanding match. Uh, you know, Bret and Perfect is the match of the night, the night, obviously, but, I mean, this was just... A very, very, very good. Uh, another thing they did, did, just as proof that comedy and wrestling truly does work, uh, Big Boss Man versus the Mountie. A uh, great character clash, because, you know, you got a, a cop and a Mountie. And uh, for some reason, I never thought it was silly that they would be playing those characters because of how well they played them. And uh, when they said that Big Boss Man was a former prison guard, I, I just bought it because he looked like one. So I was like, yeah, sure, okay, former prison guard turned wrestler. I, I, I'll buy that. I'll go with that. And it was a great character clash, and the match itself was all right. Um, but what happened afterwards, the winner of the match, or the loser of the match, would go to spend the night in jail. That, that was the stipulation. And obviously with a stipulation like that, I think you know the heel's going to lose, because it's not funny if the, the baby face gets sent to jail. It's, you know, you, you present yourself with great comedy, you have to have uh, the heel go through all the humiliating stuff. Uh, when it's time for him to, you know, after you've built him up, and it's time for him to be humiliated. And... It, I think some of the stuff they did with Mountie in the jail, to this day even, is still some of the funniest stuff the WWE's ever done. It is real. If you haven't seen it, go back and watch it. It is really, really funny. Uh, him acting like a crybaby, uh, being carted away to jail. It was really... And it didn't feel like a comedy skit. I think that's something that also helped. It really did feel like he was in a jail. And that the fact that it felt a little bit more real made it even funnier. It didn't feel like it's just some cartoon sketch. It felt like, oh my god, this guy's in jail. And it's, he's going to be spending the night in hell. And uh, the final joke was obviously uh, his cellmate, who was, uh, I guess, Bubba or something. And uh, he walks up to him and says, don't you just love the way leather feels against your body? And it, <laughs> that was a nice capstone to the whole thing. Not a very PG joke, but... Uh, really, really funny. So, uh, really enjoyed that, and that always sticks out to me as some of the great comedy that the WWF has provided over the years. 
Uh, and, and they get knocked for their comedy a lot. They've done a lot of shitty comedy. I'm not going to deny that. But this is a case where it absolutely worked. Um, the main event, or the wrestling main event, was Hogan and Warrior versus Slaughter, General Adnan, and Colonel Mustafa, which I wasn't a huge fan of. It was kind of, I guess it was cool to see Hogan and Warrior team up, especially as a kid. But I just kind of felt like, why are they teaming up against the Iraq sympathizers? Because the Gulf War was over by this point. And Hogan already beat Slaughter at WrestleMania 7. And I know uh, SummerSlam, uh, especially in its early years, kind of had this WrestleMania Part 2 aspect to it where the main event was like a tag team version of what happened at WrestleMania. And uh, it was some kind of a sequel to WrestleMania, basically. And it's kind of um, Extreme Rules or whatever the April pay-per-view is now, Backlash, uh, has kind of become that where... Um, the main event is usually just a repeat of the WrestleMania main event, usually. Or there'll be a bunch of WrestleMania rematches, at least. Uh, so, um, the April pay-per-view is kind of taken over for SummerSlam in that regard. Uh, but I wasn't a huge fan of it, because I just felt like, isn't the story over? I mean, the marketing was cool. The match made in hell. I mean, that was like... Uh, again, to a six-year-old, that sounds pretty badass. But, um, I, I, it was what it was. They brought in Sid Vicious, Sid Justice here. Uh, to be the special guest referee and eventually set him up for a match with Hogan down the road. But, uh, you know, um, it wasn't that special of a main event. It was Warrior's last match. You all know the story behind that. It was weird, though, as a kid because there was no internet back then, so I had no access to any backstage information of what was going on. Uh, so it was really weird to see Warrior just run backstage and then you never see him again. <laughs> that's, that's it. Warrior's done. Um, so that was really funny. But, yeah, I, I would have rather they'd done... Hogan and Warrior versus Undertaker and Jake Roberts, because uh, they had just done a series of vignettes on TV. Very stupid vignettes. I'm not going to deny that. They were very, even as a kid, I thought they were stupid. Uh, with Jake Roberts trying to bring out the quote unquote dark side of the Ultimate Warrior by burying him in a casket and locking him in a room with a cobra or some shit like that. It, it, it made no sense. It felt like Ultimate Warrior wrote the thing. Um, and uh, Jake, like, turned on Ultimate Warrior and sided with The Undertaker and. Uh, and, and whatever, but it, as stupid as those segments were, I think it would have been more interesting if they'd done Hogan and Warrior versus Jake and Undertaker for reasons like, A, I wanted to see, I always wanted to see Hogan face Jake Roberts because I think at the very least it would have been a great character clash. I'm not sure how the match would have gone down, but I think the character clash would have been very good and would have been cool to watch. And plus, you had uh, Hogan and Undertaker for Survivor Series to set up, and this would have been a good way to set up that. Uh, with Undertaker, because by this point, Undertaker was viewed as, like, unbeatable. Like, you couldn't hurt him. Uh, so when they put him up against Hogan at Survivor Series, it was like, oh, God, like, Hogan's kind of screwed here. It was, it had that kind of feeling to it. And uh, I would have rather they'd done that instead, but they had to have uh, Jake and Undertaker off the show so they could uh, um, attack Randy Savage and Liz at their wedding reception <laughs> after the show. We didn't get the wedding reception. Um, but that'll lead me into the match made in heaven, which was the uh, Macho Man and Elizabeth wedding, which they wisely put on at the end of the show. I, I say wisely because um, all the wrestling action was done. You'd gotten everything. And if you didn't want to see the wedding, you just switched the show off. So uh, it didn't interrupt the flow of the wrestling. Normally the temptation would be to just... Um, put it in the middle of the show as like a downer or a piss break type of thing. But to me, that kind of disrupts the flow of the show. Um, and uh, TNA did that with uh, Slammiversary a couple years ago, and it really kind of threw the show out of whack, I think. Um, but here, they stuck it on at the end. If you want to watch it, fine. If you don't want to watch it, even better. Uh, <clears throat> but I actually kind of like this wedding. I'm not a huge fan of wedding angles in wrestling, but I like this one because uh, they put a lot of time into the Liz and Randy relationship. And it's really sad looking at it now, just looking at uh, this cover, you know, knowing that they both passed away since then. Um, it, it, they really were, like, one of the most the best couples in wrestling ever. Um, that moment at WrestleMania Seven where they reunited, I think, is one of the best moments ever written for wrestling. It wasn't, you know, a lot of the moments that get people to cry in wrestling are, you know, retirements or things of that nature, uh, things that are, you know, bound to happen. But... Uh, and things that have an edge of realism to them. But Liz and Randy, that was just good writing. I mean, yeah, they were married in real life, but it was uh, they put a, so much effort into their, you know, starting as manager and wrestler, then becoming something more, then the breakup when Savage turned heel, and then the, reuni the reunion at WrestleMania 7. 
it was a really great emotional moment um, that, uh, you know, the, the women that you see in the crowd that are crying, totally legitimate response. It didn't feel like they were a bunch of plants to me. It, it totally looked like a real response. Uh, and so to me, it made perfect, perfect sense because they put so much work into it to do a wedding. Uh, <clears throat> maybe doing it on pay-per-view was a bit much, but I thought it came off fine. And again, they tacked it on at the end so you didn't have to watch it if you, all you wanted were the matches. And... Uh, Obviously, that eventually led to the wedding reception where Jake Roberts and Undertaker attacked them at the wedding reception, which was kind of kind of funny. But, uh, you know, it led to Randy's eventual return to the ring and feud with Jake Roberts, which I think that is one of the best, one of the most underrated feuds ever. I mean, the, the feud that those two had, the promos and everything, was just outstanding. Go watch their match from Tuesday in Texas. Uh, it's not one of the greatest matches of all time. It's kind of short. But the stuff that everything they did surrounding it is outstanding. It, it is some of the best wrestling television you'll ever see. It, it was just perfect. And Jake played his character so just beautifully well. Um, but yeah, those are the things that really stick out to me about SummerSlam 91 and the whole experience about it. And uh, it's one of my fondest memories as a wrestling fan. It was uh, something it, it's something that I treasure. I'll never throw this tape away. It's. Um, I wish I still had the original VHS tape that I recorded it on. Um, I had to throw it away a few years ago because I watched it and the quality was just total ass. It was the tape would fall apart, and the tape had like the. Uh, uh, the the movie trailers on it was Star Trek VI and the and the hand that rocks the cradle, but uh, yeah, I mean that, that there was no helping it. It couldn't be it it died and it was before there was you know enough technology for me to record it on uh, on DVD, so I couldn't do that. But uh, you know it is what it is. I still got this and I, I've got so many fond memories of that pay per view that it was great. And I can't think of too many pay per views that I look back on. I was like, man, that was a lot of fun. And you know, nostalgia is a beautiful thing because it, there's always it's always through rose colored glasses. But uh, yeah, SummerSlam '91. I just wanted to share that story with you and, and discuss a more positive experience that I had uh, from my youth in professional wrestling. Okay, and this will be my preview of SummerSlam 2012. Um, I'm going to try and keep this moderately short since the first part of this video went way longer than I originally planned. But, uh, yeah, first thing right off the bat that I'm going to congratulate the WWE for, they have a full card! Just about seven matches! I mean, that's... In the last, I don't know, year and a half or so, that might be a record for them, except for, you know, WrestleMania. But it just seems like every year they... They get worse and worse at actually announcing all the matches for the show, and we get more and more bonus matches that go unadvertised, and ultimately nobody cares about them because they weren't advertised, so they weren't given a reason to care. Uh, and that's become an increasing problem with the WWE. Even the Royal Rumble seems to have one or two bonus matches thrown in. I'm like, it's the fucking Royal Rumble. I mean, one hour's filled for you. I mean, is it really that hard to fill a three-hour show with matches? I mean, damn. Uh, but, yeah, that, that's been a problem with them, and they at least moderately fixed it here. They've got seven. There might be one bonus match. I know there's a musical performance or something, but, um, you know, so this might be it. I don't know. Uh, but, yeah, they actually have a full card. I have a whole card to talk about. That's good. Um, now, as for the matches themselves... Did, could have done a better job building a lot of them up. Uh, what, what do we have here? We have the Tag Team Championship, Kofi Kingston and R-Truth versus the Primetime Players, which once AW got fired, any interest I had in this match pretty much died because I was actually kind of liking AW. Uh, I mean, I know he's one of those characters that's like, oh, I'm black, so I got to talk all stereotypical and like, you know, like Teddy Long, player, player. Uh, he was one of those guys, but uh, where he had, he, it felt like anyway, he had to put on a voice uh, just to enact a stereotype. But, uh, and there have been a lot of those types of characters in wrestling. But, A.W. was funny, and I, li I felt like he was kind of a recreation of Jimmy Hart with the live mic. Unfortunately, that was kind of his undoing with the Kobe Bryant joke, which I personally wasn't offended by, but I have a high threshold. And, and you know, personally, I don't think it's a rape joke, because Kobe Bryant was acquitted. So, I was like, if, if you read rape into that, it's, you know, whatever. <laughs> it's like, he was found innocent. I, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, and I actually thought the joke was funny. So, uh, and I'm not going to try and get into the whole debate of, you know, whether or not rape jokes are funny. That's been floating around a lot lately. But uh, rape is not funny. I will definitely say that rape is absolutely not funny. It's absolutely deplorable. But, um... I don't know. <laughs> I'm going off on a tangent here. I mean, this video is going to be really, really long, I think. 
Uh, but yeah, I was really liking AW's character, but because of one live, one joke with a live mic, and one comment on Twitter against Linda's Senate campaign, which I'm dreading. I, I, she's gonna lose the election, but uh, she won the primary, and I'm just like, ugh. You can't see my eyes rolling. Ugh, rolling the eyes. Uh, so you gotta put up with more of that. I mean, really, why do you want to be in the Senate? God damn it! It's just no, no. You're not cut out for this. You're really not, and I'm not getting into a Republican or Democrat thing. It's like no, uh, n no. I do. We do not need the McMahons in Congress. That's <laughs> we don't need that. Okay, we we have enough problems in this country as it is. Uh, but anyway, yeah. Once AW's gone, I mean that's pretty much it for the primetime players in my eyes because I don't think they're that good. It was just the whole act to me hinged on AW, and now without him, it's kind of like well, I kind of don't care. So, um, and I also have to wonder is like how much of AW's behavior is going to reflect on them. I mean, they were probably going to win the titles here because you know every new tag team that gets a push wins the titles. And uh, I don't know if that's going to happen now because, you know, are, are they going to get punished for what AW did? I don't know. We'll just have to wait and see. I'll, uh, I'll pick them to win the titles, but, you know, it could just as easily stay, stay with our truth and Kofi Kingston, which, you know, it's the tag titles. I, I don't really care. But um, they've got, you know, I keep reading that Triple H wants to push tag team wrestling, but he's got a long way to go. I would even consider dropping the tag team division at first and then bringing it back like six months later once you have a plan in place and you have like teams and developmental all set up. It's like, it's time to like scorch the earth and then start from scratch, uh, I think. But uh, yeah, there's that. Then you have the Intercontinental title, which is right back to being uh, the belt that's held for few, former world champions when the WWE has no idea what to do with them. Excuse me. And in this case, it's The Miz and, and Rey Mysterio. And, you know, I'm so glad that they dropped Cody Rhodes. They had him drop the title at WrestleMania. It's like, you had something good going there with the IC title, and you dropped it just to give Big Show a WrestleMania moment. Really paid off. Because <laughs> the IC title is just right back to where it was. Uh, and then they had Cody win the belt back. It's like, all right, maybe you can repair the damage. No, he just drops it to Christian for no reason. No reason. And then Christian just drops it to Miz after Miz hasn't won a match in God knows how long. So it's like, that's, that's why nobody cares about wins and losses, and that's why nobody cares about the titles, because it just, it just doesn't fucking matter. Um, so, I mean, these two might have a good match, but it's just, I, it's really hard for me to really give a shit about the Intercontinental title. Uh... <laughs> I'll pick Miz to retain, I guess. I I don't know. I could just as easily see Mysterio winning it, but we'll see. Um, then there's Daniel Bryan versus Kane, which, why is Daniel Bryan like a clown now? Why? He's become like, and it's almost like what they did with Heath Slater, really, where it feels like every time I tune into the show, he's being humiliated. And, I mean, yeah, I understand it's okay to get some laughs, and every now and then Daniel Bryan has a good laugh, but... It's like, if he's the heel, you want to build him up to taking the fall. you got to set up the pins and then go for the strike. But they're not even setting up the pins. He just gets humiliated every week. That's why the Heath Slater storyline didn't work. Because it wasn't a storyline. There's no story. It's just him. It's just a gag every week where he gets beat up by some legend. And then on the 1,000th episode, all the legends come back and get their revenge for nothing. Because he never did anything. Because he lost every all the time. And that was it. There's no story there. You didn't have a villain build his heat and then take a fall. You just had a guy take his fall. It's 80s cartoon booking is basically what it is. Daniel Bryan right now is Skeletor getting his ass kicked by He-Man every single week. Because that's what was He-Man and the Masters of the Universe was all about. It was Skeletor's like, Grey Skull will be mine, He-Man. And then he gets his ass kicked. And that's, you know... It's fine for an 80s cartoon because that's kind of what they had to do back then, but when you're trying to run storylines and you're trying to sell fictional fights and you're trying to sell pay-per-views, you got to let your villains get some traction here, and Daniel Bryan is absolutely nothing. Uh, and I was hoping that something would pan out with Charlie Sheen. Not that I was looking forward to seeing Charlie Sheen on the show, but uh, I, I thought it would be kind of cool if Daniel Bryan benefited from the media attention that goes along with Charlie Sheen, but none of that really came to pass so i was like all right whatever so it's just daniel bryan versus kane because aj's trying to screw him over uh, yeah i find that funny with authority figures where it's like oh if you're a heel authority figure 
picking on the baby faces, you're evil. But if you're a baby face <laughs> authority figure picking on the bad guys, then you can go to hell. Uh, or you're awesome. That's what you are. You're you know the heels can go to hell. They can be screwed over, and the authority figures can abuse their power all they want. Booker T. He's not going to do a damn thing to Sheamus for committing Grand Theft Auto, but Alberto Del Rio, he gets revenge on him for doing that. It's like, oh, you lose your title match, son. <laughs> Sucker. Uh, but it, it's, you know, double standards. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, Daniel Bryan and Kara don't, don't really care. I guess, I, I mean, I have no reason to think Daniel Bryan's going to win because they just keep humiliating him, and he's lost every pay-per-view since February. So, um, I mean, he could very well win, but... Uh, he needs to get some traction because he is one of the more over acts in the company and they need to start giving him something to work with beyond just getting humiliated every week because after a while that's going to wear thin uh, then there is uh, well, oh this match I actually really want to see uh, Dolph Ziggler versus Chris Jericho um, I think these two are going to have a very good match I think Dolph Ziggler's in very good hands because Chris Jericho's a guy a veteran who I always trust working with young guys because he never goes over when he shouldn't okay triple h there's a fear undertaker there's a fear jericho never i never worry that if there's a case where a guy's getting pushed and jericho has to face him i never oh well i, I never think uh the wrong decision is going to be made and jericho's going to go over uh and you know ziggler they want to push him to the world title he's going to get the world title because he's got the money in the bank and that's pretty much a set deal now i mean yeah cena failed but it's you know it's cena he's had 80 of those things i don't or, you know he's had like what 13 14 world title reigns i mean if you've had over 10 you've had it 100 times so it really doesn't matter but uh yeah but uh yeah ziggler they're going to want to push him and i think he's in good hands with jericho and i think they're going to have a good match it might be jericho's last match uh, with this run, we'll see. Uh, so I'm pretty much counting on him being done after this, uh, for this run. Um, but yeah, I think they'll have a very good match, and I expect them to mesh very well. So hopefully that, uh, that works out for them. Uh, next up we got the World Heavy... Oh, and obviously Ziggler's going to win that match. I have no doubt that Ziggler's going to win that match. Uh, World Heavyweight Championship, Sheamus versus Alberto Del Rio. I didn't care when they did it, and then it will ultimately change into a four-way. I didn't care when they did it last month. I don't care that they're doing it this month. I didn't care that the match was canceled. I don't care that the match is on. I, I just do not give a shit about these characters or this feud. Although I will say, Alberto Del Rio is the baby face in this feud. I do not care what anybody tells me. That car hood thing that they keep showing over and over again, which makes no sense because Sheamus is completely fine. I mean, they, they keep showing that over and over again, and I'm just like... A, Sheamus is completely fine and only missed one match, the match he was supposed to have that night. Other than that, he's fine. And two, Sheamus already beat him and got his revenge over that, so why do you keep going back to that? I don't understand that. But, it, like, he keeps showing it like it's the most heinous thing, and it, it, it accomplished almost nothing for Del Rio. Because, uh, again, Sheamus was completely fine next week. He's more Kryptonian than Cena. Um, well, not well, until he gets slammed uh, through a spotlight. <laughs> you know. That, that was the most Kryptonian thing ever done. Well, see, now I'm thinking back. Triple H at Survivor Series 2000 came back in eight days after being dropped from, like, 30 feet in the air out of a forklift uh, with a car. And he comes back with just Band-Aids. And it's like, yeah, that, that, that would happen, you know. But, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, so there were, uh, that segment with the car hood... Um, Sheamus initiated the attack. So in my mind, I'm like, no, Alberto Del Rio. Go back and watch the segments. Sheamus started it. So to me, it's like, hey, Alberto just finished what Sheamus started. You know, don't 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 start what you can't finish. Uh, and you know, self defense and everything of, of that nature. So no, I was like, all right, Del Rio, he's justified in that case. And then when he attacked him on SmackDown a couple weeks, or I think it was last week. Yeah, it was last week. I was like, look, the dude stole his car. First of all, he should have called the cops. And Sheamus was kind enough to provide video evidence with the tout videos, which, that's smart. Uh, <laughs> I mean, in any other reality, he'd be in jail right now. But, uh, yeah, it was like, so you expect me to feel sh sorry for Sheamus after destruction of property and Grand Theft Auto? No, it was like, he should be in jail right now. <laughs> I mean, when Austin would do bad things, like when he would beat up Vince McMahon, they would take him to jail because that's what would happen in real life. Uh, they treat it like it's funny. Hey, you want to get back at somebody who was mean to you? Steal his car. And then videotape yourself stealing his car. I don't commit crimes, but even if I did, I would never videotape myself doing it. And I certainly wouldn't videotape myself doing it and then post it on the internet. But whatever. Somebody, 
<laughs> so much, so much stupid shit with this feud. But um, yeah, I don't give a shit. Uh, Sheamus is going to retain. I see no reason for Del Rio to get the belt at this point. He's already lost like two or three times. So what's the point? I just keep it on Sheamus, you know, at this point. Uh, then we got the WWE Championship, which will be CM Punk defending against John Cena, defending against Big Show. Why is Big Show in this? Uh, they keep saying he's an unstoppable monster, even though he loses all the time. I don't think he's won a match since the cage match with Cena, and he lost that. So before the cage match with Cena, I don't think he's won a match. If he has, I don't remember it, because it seems like he's getting his ass kicked. Again, what I talk about with heels, they said Jerry Lawler said on commentary that Big Show was the favorite going into this match. And I'm sitting there like, he never wins. He, and he's always getting his ass kicked, so how is he the favorite? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. And, uh, y you know, I mean, they've, if you're going to push Big Show as a monster, do it correctly. But they didn't do it correctly. So, at least with Ryback, and you can call it a Goldberg uh, ripoff all you want, and it is. But at least it's like, look, I mean, he's more of a monster than fucking Big Show is right now. Like, I buy, I mean, Ryback's unbeatable right now. So I buy that. Uh, Big Show, he loses all the time. I don't take him as a serious threat to the title. Why is he in the title? Why is he being called a monster? I don't know. Um, I also don't understand why they're building up Punk to turn heel when they already turned him heel. It's kind of like what they did with Eve at WrestleMania, where they had her turn on Ryder and turn heel, even though she had already done that and was already a heel. <laughs> so I was like, wow, way to keep me on my toes there, I guess. So it just seems weird. It's like Punk turn heel... And the next week on Raw reflected that, and now he's right back to being a tweener. I um, I mean, this isn't like the 09 heel turn where we knew the heel turn was coming, but they didn't turn him heel. They actually did an expert job of building him up to that moment. But it's like now they're building up to a moment that's already happened. It's like, yeah, he's he turned heel. He beat up The Rock, and then he acted like a douche nozzle the next week on Raw. He's a, he's a heel. I, I mean... What, are, are we backtracking on that, or, or what's the deal there? What the dilly-dally? Um, but yeah, this match just kind of feels like a prelude to Cena and Punk, at, uh, which will probably be at the next pay-per-view. Uh, it doesn't really feel like uh, anything that major or impressive, although there is talk that it's going to close the show. Um, I would just have Punk retain here, it just, but I will say... It, I do want Punk and Rock to happen at WrestleMania, not at the Royal Rumble. So if Cena has to win the belt for that to happen, you know, Cena faces the Rock at the Royal Rumble, and then CM Punk goes on to face, let's say Punk wins the Rumble and then goes on to face the Rock at WrestleMania, that to me is a more desirable situation. So if Cena has to beat Punk for the belt to make that happen, I'm all for it. So, yeah, because I don't want Punk and Rock at Mania. I, want, I, I, don't, I don't want Punk and Rock at the Rumble. I want it at Mania. Uh, do the Cena Rock rematch of the Royal Rumble and then do uh, what I feel the fresher match, save that for WrestleMania. And I think that would be a really big one, a really cool one to have. Um, so, yeah, I'll pick Punk to retain here, but I wouldn't be surprised if Cena won. Putting it on Big Show at this point would be stupid because you already ruined him. But uh, then we have what I feel is the true main event of the show and the one that I th I'm most excited to see. And I think WWE's done a fantastic job building it for the most part. Um, it's had its silly moments here and there, uh, but overall, they've done a really good job of giving this feud time, letting it grow and develop, telling the story slowly, and then giving us a payoff at this pay-per-view. Uh, Brock Lesnar versus Triple H. I think it's a big match. I would probably close with the show. I mean, I know Punk as champion has not closed a single pay-per-view this year, but, uh, you know, it was mostly the cases that I disagreed with, like Kane and Cena and... Cena and Laurinaitis, which was, that was an insult. Uh, that was, Vince was trolling there. Uh, I'm convinced of it. Cena and Big Show, uh, a Money in the Bank ladder match. I mean, there are other cases where the WWE title match should have closed and it didn't, and it was stupid, and the only reason it didn't close was because Cena was in the other match. Uh, but Cena and Brock at Extreme Rules, Cena and Rock at WrestleMania, those are big matches that I buy as main events. Those should have closed. Uh, Brock and Triple H, I think, is a match that they should probably consider closing the show with because that's the one that is the most hype, that's the one that's the most interesting, and it has the biggest stars, best storyline, everything. And what I really love about the storyline, Paul Heyman has really been the glue that held this thing together, and he's really shown the value of managers. What's the knock that everybody has on Brock Lesnar? He can't talk. He sounds awful. He doesn't have to talk anymore. He's got Paul Heyman. Problem fixed. And Brock can just stand there, you know, and look menacing and just look like Ivan Drago, basically. Uh, so that's been expertly handled, and Paul Heyman has done a fantastic job of telling the story and making it 
as good as it is. So I'm really excited for that match at SummerSlam, and that to me is the major attraction. But uh, yeah, that's my thought on SummerSlam 2012. Hopefully it's a good show. I'm going to see it tomorrow night. I'm also seeing The Expendables 2 uh, tomorrow afternoon. So I'm going to have a you know very entertaining uh, evening tomorrow, so it should be fun. Um, but yeah, I know you all are probably going to see SummerSlam, so if you do, enjoy it. And I will see you all sometime next week with the SummerSlam review and other videos. Uh, I'll probably have a video earlier in the week and then one towards the end of the week, uh, you know, depending on whatever topics come up regarding professional wrestling. But yeah, that's all I got for now, and I'll see you all later.